no quick with rigor. Right? Most of the time, we're trying to get away from rigor, right? Our classes, right? You know, all of our social responsibilities, right? We want to unplug, time for the weekend, relax. But when COVID hit, right, we realized how tied to process we were and how tied to that rigor, how good it actually was. Because when COVID hit, everything was up in the air. Throw the balls up in the air, don't know where they're going to land, right? But right now, being tied to that rigor is just about the best thing you can do, right? It's having like a steady time to get up, you know, pretty much every day, right? Making sure you shower, so you're, you know, you have some routine in your life. You know, sculptor Elizabeth King had a saying, and she said, process and rigor save us from the poverty of our own intention, right? What does that mean, the poverty of our own intention? It means left unchecked, like we didn't have rigor and process in our lives, right? We have to rely on ourselves. The poverty of our own intentions is much harder to get out of bed in the morning. It's much harder to have a goal. It's much harder to have focus. So especially during this pandemic when there's not a lot of structure, right? Structure is your friend. I was saying my son is in Villanova right now. He's a sophomore playing lacrosse. They have a very structured time. You know, practice at a certain time, class at a certain time. Again, all that went out the window in COVID. I went to visit him earlier uh, earlier in the semester. One of his friends was sitting around the sofa. This was a Sunday morning. He didn't look so good. He looked like he was a little tired from the night before. And he said, Mr. Clark, I need some structure in my life. If I don't have structure in my life, I'm probably just going to drink all day. Right? And that's what we need to get away from. Right? It's getting, I know that could sound tempting, right? but getting to that structure, getting to that rigor, and embracing it in this time can be a real help for you as you go through these next couple months. Second R is responsibility. We talk about a lot, of, a lot about this in sales. You know, do you have an internal locus of control or an external locus of control? And what does that mean? An internal locus of control feels like you have some responsibility over your life. You can change your life, right? Life's not just washing over you. An external locus of control is, hey, I'm just here and I'm gonna take whatever life gives me. Right? They tell me what to do, sure, I'll do it. You know, but if I get a bad outcome, Okay, I'll just kind of go back to bed and tuck my tail between my legs. Having that internal locus of control is so important right now. And it's important because there are a lot of things that are going to happen. There's a lot of things you can't control. And you have to feel like you have some control in your life. You have to take responsibility for that. So I see at least two gentlemen here in the front row from Georgetown Prep. Shout out to Georgetown Prep. All right. So when I was a uh, junior at Georgetown Prep, we were playing St. Albans in football. Halftime, we were down 6 0. They had a fantastic team, really big, really good team. We were down 6 0. Coach was Coach Fagan at the time. He looked at us right in the eyes at halftime. He said, They're not going to give you anything. You've got to go out and take it. And I'll never forget those words. That's responsibility. That's taking responsibility for our own lives, particularly during a pandemic. Because you have more control than you think. You have more responsibility than you think. And I would encourage you, certainly sticking with rigor, it's going to help you during this time, and taking that, that internal locus of control and saying, I take responsibility. That's going to help you a lot. But the third R is resilience, and that's really why we're here today. That's what I've written my book on. That's what I write my blog about. That's what my entire adult life has been about. People often get resilience wrong. They really do. They think they know resilience. They think resilience is standing tough, right? Having that stiff upper lip, powering through any pain that you might have. And certainly there's an element of perseverance to that. No question about it, right? But sometimes resilience is about pivoting. Sometimes resilience is about realizing there's pain and finding a way around it, right? It's not necessary to take pain. Pain is not just a badge of courage. Pain is something that we try to avoid. I'll tell you a quick story about that. So when I was a senior in college, taking you way back now, I lived with five other guys, all buddies, the six of us. All we wanted to do, second semester senior year, all we wanted to do was have enough money to rent a Winnebago and go to South Padre Island for spring break. That was it. That was our sole goal. Graduation, you know, we were focused. We were taking responsibility. 
So we all had odd jobs and things like that, but it wasn't enough. We needed $1,800, that's $300 a piece. So we were racking our brains trying to come up with it. I was walking through the hospital one day, kind of cutting through to get to my off-campus house, and I saw a bulletin board, went back to the bulletin board, and it said, volunteers needed, it had these dollar signs. Volunteers needed, it said experimental painkiller drug, students welcome, we'll pay dollars. $300. Oh my God, this is, this is perfect. This is like, you know, something from heaven. Angels were singing. You know, it was wonderful. And I didn't have cell phones at the time, so I couldn't take a picture of it. I couldn't call it too much. So I just ripped off the little thing that had the phone number of it. Went back, told all my friends, and uh, all six of us signed up for this experiment. You know, South Padre Island, here we come. So I go in. I was the first one. I was the guinea pig. I go in, there's a doctor in the room. I said, are you sure you paid $300 for this? Yes, he confirmed it. He had $300 cash. Perfect. They would probably never do this today. Experimental drug, sure. I didn't sign a single waiver. I just went in and looked for $300. So he said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to administer the drug. Uh, I'm give you about 10 minutes. I'm going to chill out. And I'm going to take this little pin here. I'm going to stick it into your shit. And I'm going to do it several times. And just raise your hand when you feel pain. That's it. Just raise your hand. I'll hand you $300. What could be easier? So he gives me the drug, and it's actually this incredibly strong drug. I started hallucinating, actually. I, I thought the doctor was the Easter Bunny. He's jumping around the room. It's the craziest thing. But I just stay focused on this $300, right? The $300 is the thing. So he gives me 10 minutes to kind of settle into myself. I go, he sticks it in. I don't feel it. He sticks it in my shin again. I don't feel it. He sticks it in the third time. I feel it. I raise my hand. Am I done? Yes. Here's your three hundred dollars. Couldn't be easier. So my roommate thing. I come back and say the easiest thing in the world. I crash for a bit. My roommate goes. He comes back. He's wearing shorts and he's got welts all over his shin. Huge welts. And he's got Eric right. Hey, Eric, what are you doing? And he goes. Well, I wanted to prove how tough I was. You know. And he said to raise my hand. I want to see how much pain I can take. And so he. Had them stick in about 15 different times. He didn't raise his hand. Finally, he raised his hand when he had enough. I'm like, what are you doing? He sat there and he unnecessarily put his hand. And not only was it not good for him, right? He had wilts all over his shin. It didn't help the experiment. In fact, it hurt the experiment. It didn't do anyone any good, right? So we're not out here being large. We don't need to take the pain. There are ways to deal with adversity, there are ways to deal with resilience. The ways to build your resilience as you go. And I want to talk about it. Steve teed this up, but it's just the four factors of resilience. So it's adversity, right? And I mean, just by definition, bouncing back from something, you're bouncing back from adversity. How to handle that? How to handle that in struggle? Passion, maintaining your passion. Right? When I talk about passion, it's not, oh, you got to follow your passion. It's effort. You have to care. You know, you, it's just making the effort to move forward. It's adversity, passion, perspective. Always maintaining that healthy perspective. And finally, it's appreciation. And appreciation, in my mind, is the most important. I know you're not supposed to have favorites, right? But appreciation, especially in these times, is absolutely the key to resilience. So I want to start off with adversity. Okay? We all face it. I was talking a little bit about the cross earlier. So I had a, uh, a buddy of mine, his son, a big 6'6 guy, uh, played football, also played lacrosse, he's a defense. He was getting recruited by every D1 college in the country. Right? I mean, everybody wanted this guy. And he went on four different visits. On the first visit, I won't name any of the colleges. On the first visit, the college said, look, you're going to be an All-American. Right? We crank out All-Americans, that's what we do. If that's important to you, you're going to be an All-American if you come here. We're going to be with you every step. Second one he went to said, we're here to win a national championship. You're a big part of that, right? You want to hoist that trophy? We're going to be with you on that day. We're going to be with you every step of the way. We're building a program. We promise you. Come on in. We promise you. We truly promise you that you're going to start as a freshman, and you're going to be a big part of what we're doing. It took a much different approach. So look, we think you're going to be successful. And we have confidence in you. There's going to be a day 
where you're going to get hurt, where your girlfriend's going to dump you, it happens, where your high school skills aren't going to translate to the big stage accounts, right? There are going to be days when you feel like a really small fish in a really big pond. And on that day, on your worst day, we're going to be there for you every step. Sign me up for that time, right? And that's what it's all about. And certainly on the athletic field, that's what life is all about. And Oprah Winfrey had a great quote. She said, everybody wants to survive with you on a limo. But what you want to do is surround yourself by people who will take the bus with you when the limo breaks down. And right now, the limo has broken down in a lot of areas of our life. Right? COVID has turned things upside down. Right? A lot of times we have our worst day. The most important thing is, Diversity during this time is a team sport. We can't do it alone. It's not a time to go back in your shell. It's time to find those people, right? Find those people who are in your corner. Find those people who will be with you on your worst day. Again, that's not just a COVID thing. That's a life thing. And the more you can do that, the more you can surround yourself by those people, the greater it's going to be in the uptime, and in the good time, and the stronger your life is going to be. That adversity that you face shouldn't be something you face alone. Find those people who ride with you on the bus when they're more Okay? That's adversity. I'll talk to you a little bit about passion. Okay? And again, this is to follow your passion. Have the passion. So I've been in sales most of my life, right? The last 30 years. And riding around, at this, you know, pre-COVID, riding around in traffic, a lot of traffic jams around the D.C. area. You have a lot of time to read people's bumper stuff. You see what they're all about. You can tell a lot, a lot uh, about a person. Right? What team they root for, how many kids they have, do they have dogs, what religious affiliation, just about anything. About five years ago, I was stuck behind this guy and had stickers all over the back of the school. Every inch covered with stickers. His license plate actually said stickers. And as I passed him in traffic, the entire side of his car had stickers at the top, the hood, Every inch of this guy's car. This guy was passionate about stickers. He wasn't afraid to let people know. Okay? And I saw that and I thought, okay, you know, that's not my thing. I got I have one bumper to die. My father got one sticker on my car. That's it. That's all I got. Right? Um, this guy loves stickers. But I loved that about him. Even though that wasn't my thing, he was passionate. He was wearing his heart on his sleeve. He didn't care that the world knew that he was passionate about stickers. He was proud of it. So important, and especially during this time now, especially in this pandemic, where you have your mask, you kind of feel like you want to keep to yourself. You're afraid to raise your hand in the Zoom meeting. You're afraid to ask a question. You know, you're afraid to interrupt the teacher to, to, to interject your thoughts. The exact opposite is true. That passion is more important now than ever, right? I mean, you're you're in Catholic for a reason, right? You're here for a reason. You have to let that voice shine through. You have to shout from the mountaintop. And this is the time. I have a, 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 another, I call him a friend, but Todd Henry, very successful speaker, kind of does what I do. Um, but he talks about uniqueness, right? Your voice. He's, he's got a great quote. He says, Cover bands don't change the world. Don't be a cover band. Find your uniqueness. And now is the time for. Right? I mean, not to get too religious, but what is, you, know, you, you, you light the lamp and you don't put a bushel basket on it. Right? You put it from the highest lamp post. Let it light someone else's path. More important than ever, that passion coming through. You can't stay within you. You've got to get it out. So we have adversity. Team sport. Passion. Quick story on perspective. Perspective. Again, especially now. So, um, right after I got married, we talked about this, right? I had my wife there. Right after that, I moved out with my wife to California. I've always been a writer. Uh, I was writing a screenplay uh, California. Kind of cool. Lived uh, right on the beach, had a view of the ocean every day. And I uh, was in great shape back then. Just built a run on the beach. Why wouldn't you? I mean, mountains, you know, on one side, ocean on the other, 24 7, beautiful weather, right? 365. So I was in that one of my jobs, I was feeling pretty good about myself, where I was on the path, where I was on the journey. 
had some stories that had some interest and I thought we might sell a few studios. Um, I was happy about where I was in my life. I was feeling like I was in great shape. About five miles into my run, this guy was really out of shape. He was old. He's probably younger than I am now, but I thought he was old at the time. I was, you know, 26 or so. And uh, he comes dusting by me, right? That's I mean, he runs right by me. I'm like, oh my, it's just immediately changed my perspective. Immediately, right away. Like, you know what? My stories probably aren't going to sell. I'm not doing great out here. I'm in terrible shape. This old fat guy running right by me, you know, and it's just all these negative thoughts are cascading through my head. And again, it's if he knew what I was thinking, he circled back. He's probably 20 yards ahead, he circled back. He goes, hey, man, how far into the run are you? I go, ah, you know, I'm five miles into the run. He goes, five miles. He goes, I'm 500 yards. I just joined the pack. I would die. I would absolutely die if I could be moving half that fast in my five miles. And it hit me. It's like, why was I so worried about this guy? Why did I care so much about his perspective? Right? I was on my own path. I had my own journey. Right? I let him dictate how I felt. Huge lesson. Right? We all join the path at a different time. Right? Some of us are slower to pick up concepts. Right? Some of us pick them up quickly. Right? But we can't give up. We can't let someone else dictate our own happiness. Right? FDR said it. Comparison is the thief of joy. We're constantly comparing ourselves to other people. It really takes away a lot of the joy on us. Especially now during the pandemic. Right? If you think about it, people react in different ways. Some people are like, yeah, who cares? You know, we're not have to do whatever. Some people are really, you know, they take it internally. You know, and they're having a tough time. We can't judge those people. And we can't say, oh, you know, we're having a tough time. That's what makes it good. Why can't I see things that way? You are who you are. You're on your path. You've got to keep your internal perspective at all times. So critical right now, so critical in life. Don't let someone else dictate your happiness. Run your own path. Okay, so we talked a little bit about adversity. We talked about passion. We talked about respect. As I mentioned, appreciation. Probably the most uh, important. So there are a lot of ways to think about appreciation and, and, and a lot of different no pun intended, to go down. But one, you know, really sticks out to me. Just recently, I was at a, uh, a golf trip with three of my college buddies. I, in fact, all three of them were in that experiment that I was telling you about. It did lead to a great trip to South by the Island, by the way. Uh, but, so we've gotten together. It's been 20-some years. You know, we get together every year and play golf. Played around, and I'll just tell you, you know, golf is not subjective. If you keep score, I am not a great golfer. <laughs> So I shot a 101 that day, and I was kind of disappointed about it. These other guys, they were all better golfers, but they all went way above their game. Now, none of us had a really good day. So we grabbed a beer at the end of the round, and we're talking about it. And uh, I'm sitting there saying, I shot a 101, but I missed a one-foot putt on 18. That would have been 100. I should have made that. And then on 15, I hit a sprinkler net. It just, instead of bouncing the fairway, bounced into the woods. I lost a ball. There's something. And then on seven, I hit this shot that just missed the green, but it went in the trap, and I couldn't get out of the trap. So really, I could have shot at 95. And my other buddies kind of went down the same thing. Oh, I just one shot, and it just barely trickled into the water. If that had come out, you know, I would have shot a much better round. We were focusing on everything that had been taken away. The reality is, there were every bit as many shots that went the right way, that could have gone sideways. We had one birdie that day. One birdie in our portion, 18 old. And it was a uh, buddy who went off the tee and he spliced it into the woods. It was deep, gone in the woods. It hit a miracle branch, bounced out in the middle of the fairway. And that's where he got his birdie. We weren't sitting there saying, gosh, wasn't that lucky? Wasn't that great? We were focusing on what we had lost. And I think that's a really important mindset, that appreciation, and especially now during the pandemic. It's so easy to focus on what we We've lost a lot. We've lost a lot of routine. We've lost a lot of social interaction, right? We don't wish this on anyone. We're not happy that it happened. But in that, there are a lot of positive things, right? The, the chance to make a stronger relationship with people you might not otherwise have made. Maybe get to know a teacher better, you know, more intimate in a Zoom setting. You might not otherwise have made. Right? It's focusing on the things that you gained and 
appreciate in those days, it's going to serve you well. It's going to serve you really well during the pandemic. It's going to serve you well in life. And it's a choice, right? You can focus on all the negative things that can happen. It's not going to change anything. Focusing on the opportunities that you've been given as a result of that, that is life changing. And that will help you during the pandemic. But it really comes down to people, too, and appreciate. This is the final story I'll leave. I told you it was going to be the final story. This is the story of Itaro Sasaki. So who is Itaro Sasaki? So Itaro Sasaki was an artist who lived in this very small fishing village, you know, Tsushi, the northeastern corner of Japan. 95% of, of the folks in Otsushi were fishermen. That's how they made their living. He was an artist, though. He had a first cousin who was a fisherman who died in a, um, a kind of a freak uh, fishing accident. Very tragic. And, and to Sasaki, he was really like a brother. And he was, he was understandably grief over this. So he's an artist. He's trying to think of how to express his grief. And he ended up purchasing this old fashioned phone booth in the juice store. Old fashioned phone booth, one of those English phone booths you call it. Put it high atop this hill. Um, that would overlook, um, overlook the ocean. And he bought an old rotary dial phone, put it in there, and, uh, and he would call it the wind phone. He would go out and he would call his long lost cousin who had passed away and have conversations with him about how much he missed him, how much he appreciated him, all of those great things. And this went on for about a year. It's very cathartic for Sasaki. And that would be an interesting story in normal times. That was on March 10, 2010, almost exactly. Year later, March 11, 2011, 9.2 magnitude earthquake hit eastern Japan and unleashed this catastrophic tsunami. That tsunami wiped out 4,500 people. There are 7,500 people, more than half the population of Otsushi, in a single hour gone. So now the Japanese had to deal with this grief on it in an incredible perspective. You know, I mean, Scale. They didn't know how to channel those grief. One of Sasaki's friends remembered he had this phone booth, made his way up the hill. Sasaki was fine. He was way up on this hill. So his property was untouched, his phone booth was untouched, and, and made a call. He called his family member. He told a friend, he told a friend. Soon it was like, honestly, it was like the Japanese field of grief. There were, there were over, over a thousand people on the second day came to use the wind phone. Over 10,000 people over the course of the next three months used that wind phone to express their grief. And it was very cathartic. And it helped them grieve. And that's a wonderful thing. But the point I want to leave you here with tonight don't wait for the phone booth. Don't wait for the phone booth. Expressing appreciation has to happen right now. I believe that you can have great conversations with people in the past, and I do. Right? As a Catholic, you know, absolutely believe in the afterlife. But the best conversations are right here, right now. It's with the people that we share meals with, we, sh you know, we share our rooms with, we share campus with. It's with our parents, telling them how much we appreciate this incredible opportunity to come here. It's with our loved ones, brothers, sisters. Right now is the time. Right? And appreciation, not just for the things that have been taken away during the pandemic, but the people, the people that are here. It's the most powerful thing you can do to get through these times and to get through life. It's never too soon, right? Because it might be too late. Now is the time to express that appreciation. Okay? So that's a little bit about resilience, right? Adversity, the ability to overcome adversity with the team, with the people who will ride the bus with you, and understanding who those people are. Passion, never swallowing your voice, feeling free to express it. Not caring for you. Respecting you. Realizing that you are running your own path. Not to let other people steal that from you. Comparison is a thief of joy. That appreciation. Focus on the things you've been given rather than have been taken away. Understand that we have people in our lives that would do anything for us. Telling them how much they do. That's the way to get through this pandemic. That's the way to get through life. I so appreciate this time you dedicated to me to come out and see me. I so appreciate the time that you give me online. It means the world to me. 
I want to thank you very much for taking this time with me. I appreciate it. Thank you. So that concludes my little talk with you this evening. I would love to take any questions you might have, anything you know about my writing, anything about the experiences I have, anything I've learned from speaking with other groups. I can take them online for any for any in this room. You know, if you don't have them, I don't want to force anyone to. If you have that passion, you know, go ahead, raise your hand, and uh, I'd love to call on you. Again, don't feel uncomfortable in any way. I won't take it personally. Anything online, Steve? Oh, yeah, I just told them that they can type them more, they can ask them. They can unmute themselves and be able to hear so. Fantastic. Fantastic. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, you know, one of the things that was taken away from me and uh, try to focus on the only thing I wanted to do my entire life, really, since I was at Georgetown Prep, was write a book and, and have someone publish it. Finally, you know, 30 years later, uh, the publisher said, sure, you know, let's go. You know, we think this is good enough. We'll get your contract right in. The happiest day of my life, the release date is going to be April 15, 2020. And I had that circle on my calendar. It was a year out, and I was ready to go. Right around mid-March, we all know what happened. 2020, right? Pandemic hit. And uh, the publisher was like, we need to release the book. And it's like, this is the whole world's upside down. we got to push this date to and it was the most devastating thing. I really felt sorry for myself, which is never what you're supposed to do. It's human nature sometimes. Even the you know, most resilient person. And I was just lamenting it. Said, okay, now my book's not going to sell. You know, I had this great big party plan. I can't have that. And here's the reality. is It got pushed, and it, it was hard you know, during that time. But so many more people were interested in resilience. And that's all. Like, this is all anyone's talking about. Resilience in the pandemic and all of this. So many more people bought the book as a result of the pandemic. Again, I didn't wish the pandemic. I'm not happy that it, that it happened. But the point is, it took away something near and dear, but it presented a whole opportunity that was never presented. So those little things like that we do that happen at this time. It's so important to, to think about and focus on. We have a question online. You mentioned that you are still friends with the guys who did that research study. Would you say that your obscure experiences have then made you closer as friends and help you lean on each other in the future? So what was the second part of that, Steve? I'm sorry. Would you say that your obscure experiences have then made you closer as friends and help you lean on each other in the future? I love that question. Absolutely. I mean, in some ways, that was a great question. That's adversity right there. We went through this, you know, we were bonded together and we had a common goal, right? So whether you're on an athletic team, team in a classroom, you know, your family, anytime you're part of a team with a common goal, you bond it together. But then it was an obscure experience. I mean, that was really a bizarre experience. I'm happy that my children turned out okay after I uh, think of the experimental drug. Um, but we talked about that for hours on end when it happened. And we discussed it how we would never let our children do that, you know, as adults later in life. That single experience, that's why I love that question. It was, it, you know, we already had a bond. That just increased it even more, right? And you're going to go through experiences like that all the time. Crazy experiences at the time, you think, oh my gosh, what good is going to come from that, right? But if you look for it, you know, those will just strengthen your bond even more. It'll bring you closer, you know? And, and all of those guys are those people that would ride the bus with me, and I would ride the bus with them if anyone breaks down. And, and that's kind of, that's what we're going for with adversity. That's what we're going through for experiences. I love that question. Thank you. Oh, yes, sir. Um, when you were uh, talking about perspective, you were talking about, you know, the golf course, you know, just all the things that had gone wrong. Um, you know, have you, you know, do you suggest any methods, of, you know, especially now, while we're just kind of watching everything go wrong over the pandemic, to kind of get out of that mindset and to try to, See the you know the good things that are that are happening. Yeah, it's really hard. I mean, it's not it doesn't come naturally. We're naturally you, we naturally want to celebrate when when tough things happen, right? We want to pout, we want to shut down, we want to go in the shell. The most important thing is to take one thing, one thing that has happened. If you can find that, you look for it. You have to be intentional because you won't find it if you aren't looking for it. You'll find all the bad things. You don't have. 
have to say, okay, what are the 10 great things that have happened to me? Because you don't want to be, you know, there's more Pollyannish about it, right? You don't want to say, like, oh, this is so great that this pandemic happened. I'm so happy. You know, here are all the great things. It's finding one thing. If you find that one thing, then there are tangential things that fall off and fall around. And for me, that one thing was, okay, now people are interested in studying. Okay, well, now I have to be them. Now I have to get it out. Okay, and that, that inspires me and that inspires my passion. And I go from there. Okay. But during those times, you know, when things, you know, let's just say a game has been canceled, a class, you know, has, has been canceled, you know, your roommate gets COVID and you've got to be in isolation. It's trying to find one thing that's possible. Right? Maybe it's a new, you know, takeout place that you didn't know existed before. That. Okay, it doesn't have to be life changing, right? But finding that one thing builds. That's a great question. I mean, I, I, I think it's so much harder. This is just, you know, I, I might get in trouble for this, but it's so much harder to be an agnostic and, and, and be resilient. Because a lot of it is faith. You have to believe that things are going to get better. You have to believe that this one thing that I've found, you know, is something that I can build on. And, and it's not about optimism and pessimism. And for me, like, I do believe in the afterlife. I do believe on this earth for a reason. You're talking about like the uh, lighting the lamp and the bushel basket. I believe there's an element to that. Like I believe everyone has a purpose. That comes from faith. Like I think that God has a purpose for everyone. I don't want to get too religious about it, but I believe that. That plays a huge role in what gives me my passion. People, you know, say, oh yeah, I don't care about resilience. Okay. I, I have no problem with that. Right? But I believe I'm here to talk about it. I'm here to make my corner of the world a little bit better because I have that faith, and that's religion, right? That's religion because I have that faith, it makes me more able to do that and to build it. So, just having that faith that we're here for a reason, that we have a larger purpose in life, not just here to paint by numbers, and that's a big part of my belief, and that really keeps me going. Thank you. Any other questions? Anything online? Thank you for sharing your insights. Oh, well, that's so nice to hear. Feedback. Feedback is a gift. So I love it. Well, thank you so much for coming out. I really do mean it. I mean, it's awesome, right? You came out and took the time. Thank you so much for spending the time listening to me. Hopefully, there were some insights in there. Hopefully, we made this uh, corner of the world a little bit better. And uh, again, oh, another question. I love it. I, can, I got all my. Just one more thing. Oh. You know, is there, how, would you, how would you help? Know someone that you know that you know or someone that you're close to um, that's kind of stuck in a rut and not believing that um, you know there is good in a bad situation, having trouble finding that one thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and trust me, that happens all the time, you know, especially now. And what I have to do is think about the future. So I was uh, quoted in this Wall Street Journal article recently about okay, well, how do you keep that mindset? When you're really down. What gets you to Someone's having a tough time. <laughs> when they're having a tough time, they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear the rah rah. Like I try not to be the rah rah guy all the time because there are times you just don't want to hear it, right? You're, you're, you're in a bad way, right? And it's hard to get through. So you gotta let people calm down a little bit. Then picture yourself in a time where this is gonna happen. So take take the pandemic. Picture yourself two years from now. Two years from now, you know what do you miss the most? What are the things you're most looking for? For me, it's you know, hearing live music in a bar, drinking a Guinness. You can't do any of those things right now. You can't go to a bar, you can't drink a Guinness, you can't listen to live music. Okay? But there's a time where that's going to come back, right? And it's not the future. Focusing on that makes you appreciate this time even more because you can't have it. Right? So I can't have that. Right now. But I know there's a time where I can. I know that losing streaks end, right? I know that bad you know, luck ends. I know that pandemics end, they don't go on forever. So picturing, your, picturing yourself during that time and then imagining that happens, it just gives you more hunger, thirst, in this case, to get back. That's a really good way to get out of that rut, that mindset. Picture yourself X number of days from now, two, a year from now, whenever it is. Those tough times and those bad thoughts, they don't last forever. They're fleeting. Cool. Any 
other questions? Awesome. All right. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'm all ears.